thank you so much. Um, it is wonderful to receive this award and being honored for work which maybe not too long ago was pretty much outside the box and not necessarily accepted. And what I'm going to be doing um, in the talk today is, oops, somebody needs to make that um, full screen. I, I thought I will maybe uh, introduce a little bit the broader picture of uh, this research agenda on um, experience effects, um, the, the concept um, also of what I sometimes like to call behavioral economics 3.0, although you will see it's not just behavioral economics, um, and then go to the specific application to, um, to, to inflation. And in, in a nutshell, while well, we're waiting for the slides, <laughs> in a nutshell what um, this um, uh, research, um, which has become known as uh, experience effects, tries to do is the following. It tries to account for our personal lifetime experiences being a big determinant of our, of our long-term behavior. So for, for a while in behavioral economics, behavioral finance, we have recognized that people do not necessarily think about the world and make financial and economic decisions rationally taking all information into account they have. But what has been missing is the notion that what we have seen with our own eyes and f felt in our own skin as we have been walking through life to you know, wherever, whatever stage in your education or career you are at today, will get excess weight, will get a lot of weight in our thinking about the world. It has nothing to do with um, lack of information. I mean, that's of course important. So for example, um, with, with Paolo here, I've been working on um, the long-term effects of the Swedish crisis from 1990 to 1994 and how it might have been affecting people in their decision-making. Now, one thing is to say, whoa, this crisis happened. So we had to rethink the banking system, the real estate markets. Some people lost money and got poorer. And as economists, we all take this into account and update, and then we can predict how they will behave going forward. Um, that's standard economics, and maybe to some extent, some behavioral economics, some kind of um, maybe some overconfidence, ex ante, and some, some, some cost fallacy at, at some point. But what, what I'm interested in bringing into economics is that we are humans. And even if we've all learned everything that can be known about the 19, 19, 1904 crisis here, we know everything that can be known about the causes, the mechanisms that led to it, how people made wrong decisions. I can give all of you a test about it and you write down the correct answer. So it's not about information. Then I'm predicting that those of you who really personally experienced it and were like felt it in their own well-being, felt it as decision makers and firms, felt it as policy makers, will in certain moments of decision making think back to it and will be affected of what happened last time um, when kind of these adverse outcomes happened, when you, I don't know, invested in the real estate market, uh, for example. Even if you're perfectly informed, you're super smart, it's not just about the person in the street who doesn't really know what to, what to do. So to take an example that, um, um, Hopefully every, I mean, I'm sorry to say that I expect everybody of us uh, in the room has had some immediate exposure to is um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, when we think about what impact that experience of living through the pandemic had on us, well, a man, many economists obviously got immediately on the topic. There's lots of papers about it. Now, from a standard economic perspective, from the standard economic thinking, um, what made sense for economists to look at first was, for starters, the immediate impact, right? The pandemic hits, we are all, um, you know, asked to stay home. As a result, we have less interaction, less interaction at work. We have also um, maybe so learned to do different types of online behavior, online shopping, telemedicine. Uh, Maria Sunta, I was talking about how we stopped going to yoga or bar classes, but learn to use these apps and do this, do this at home um, instead. And then, you know, in the finance realm, Robin Hood was, you know, trending on Twitter, everybody was doing it. The, these meme stocks like GameStop and AMC Entertainment Holdings um, started becoming a thing. And that, of course, makes sense to study how these constraints were exposed to affect our economic and financial decision making. Then there's more medium run impact. So the pandemic may have affected my earnings or wealth. Uh, people suffer job loss, educational choices and job choices are affected, schools change policy about tests, et cetera, et cetera. But here, what we are after um, today and in my research is the long run impact, in this case of the pandemic, beyond 
ch those changes in jobs, in health measures, etc. Are there any changes, you may ask yourself right now, that you feel are here to stay? Does, are there ways in which this experience of having lived through the pandemic affects your beliefs and behavior in the long run? So let's do kind of a little exercise and magical thinking about like um, the, 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 the long-term effects of the pandemic and start from a scenario where we think, well, suppose nobody was actually affected in the long term in terms of their educational paths, didn't get derailed or career paths, they kind of got back onto it. And, you know, uh, hopefully from some of us, um, that's true. And let's also say that our, you know, the usual variable we economists are interested in, our earnings and earnings path looking forward is the same as it was before. Accumulated wealth is not much affected, so we're kind of back to a pre-pandemic world. Then my question is, under these assumptions, would we be back to pre-pandemic behavior, financial and economic decision making? And that's exactly what um, both standard economics and actually behavioral economics and behavioral finance would say, right? Because what are we? We're just li this little automata of making our decisions, walking through the world, whether we're fully rational or irrational, of course, it's ceteris paribus, it's holding constant like other, other constraints. Um, and therefore, it's not, I'm not claiming that economists are saying we are completely back to the world before, but it's for other reasons. Um, supply chain issues still affect us and therefore we are not back. Or we've all incurred the cost of learning how to do video conferences and therefore we use them more. I mean, it's these types of arguments. But that's um, not all I see being at work today. So if I look at the behavior of my students, if I look at the staff at my university that's resistant to come back to, to work at school, if I look at uh, what concerns politicians I'm advising in the role, uh, which was mentioned earlier on, um, I feel that we have to say that we have changed in some respects and behave differently even if the world had returned to exactly how, how it was before. At least that's what I'm trying to argue here. So what I'm trying, so what the big difference between these models of experience effects or, you know, models of human decision making, so not homo economicus, not a behavioral model necessarily, but homo, homines, like human says, is that in the existing model, whether or not I personally experience the pandemic or crisis, should affect me no different than having information about it. Ceteris paribus, of course, right? Like my, I have to control for wealth in everything. Um, so if I live through a depression, um, financial depression time, it will not affect my financial investment any different than just reading about it. Um, having personally experienced unemployment should not affect my long-term job choices, consumption spending, savings uh, behavior, any different than just knowing my risk of future unemployment. And of course, Cetera is Paribus holding constant wealth income, et cetera. Living through a pandemic should be no different from knowing about the likelihood and implications. And what this new agenda, this research, that both the theory and the empirics on experience effects say is that instead, personal experiences have a lasting impact on beliefs and behavior. And it's actually very consistent with what we know from medicine, neuroscience, cognitive science, from various STEM fields. I think we economists can start taking more seriously. As we live through these crisis experiences, we literally get rewired. Synapses are formed in our brain. And if this happens for long enough, um, the so-called long-term tagging concept, these synapses get strengthened and we easily go back then if, for example, we hear the word, cra word crash and we've lived through a big stock market crash, you know, some memories will be called and will, will be used. Now, this is not set in stone. Neuroplasticity also says we can update. Um, but it makes sense for every person who's a behavior you want to predict and understand, including your own maybe, uh, to go back and say what happened in their life so far and how m will it translate into my decision making today if I put a little extra weight on it. So differently from what has been done already, maybe on memory or over extrapolation in existing literature, it's important that for every person that can be different depending on what your personal experience was. Also your age matters. It's not just, oh, we overweigh a little bit what happens in the last two or three years. That is true actually. But if I'm a relatively young person, that's a big part of my life and I put a lot of weight, 
If I'm a 70-year-old person, I've seen lots of things happening already. I'm actually getting closer to the rational person because I'm realizing there's ups and there's downs, and it's not such a big part of what my life has been about. So I'll, I'll use a couple of non-inflation examples to kind of just illustrate it, and then going to get to the main uh, topic of inflation. So the famous example in the US, um, not so much in parts of Europe, but uh, you've certainly heard about it, is example of depression babies. Um, so the idea that people who have lived through these times when Wall Street crashed and billions lost stocks uh, as the crash happened, so the Great Depression, are um, scarred by it and avoid everything risky uh, like the plague. So that's a notion that has always been out there uh, in, in the US, that you can know who are the people who lived through the, through the Great Depression. And Basically, the, the first paper in the literature joined with uh, Stefan Nagel um, was the paper where we asked, is this true? Can we show it? And can we, in fact, possibly generalize it beyond just the Great Depression? And here's just some raw data to motivate it. If you look at how many people in a different generation, in, a diff in, in various cohorts, are stock market participants. So here, people mid-30s to mid-40s, in the cohort born up to 1920, next bar 21 to 30, 31 to 40, and, and so on and so forth, you see that, well, the participation of the generation that experienced the 1930s Great Depression as teenagers, adults, is with 13% lower than that of all other cohorts, 26 to 32. Um, you see it going up. You see it peaking in the 31 to 40 cohort which experienced the post-World War II boom years during their young adult lives, um, and um, not, then has a participation rate that's more than twice as high as in the Depression babies. But you also see it dipping again afterwards, um, consistent with the fact that that 41 to 50 cohort uh, reached that age, mid-30s to mid-40s, right after the Depression years, oil price shocks, stagflation um, of the 1970s. So this is just raw data. And we basically asked, can we, can we show that there is excess weight put on stuff that has happened in your life and that has probably left an impression on you? So just, I, I know not everybody in the room is, is technical, as I, I'll, I'll just explain, but just to kind of illustrate what we do, we basically say, if we want to predict whether you are a stock market participant in the US in this case, so your person I, who at time T is either putting at least $1 in the stock market or not, that's the YIT there, then let's throw in this empirical analysis everything we usually throw in, like wealth, income, education, like all the usual demographic controls which tend to have predictive power. And then let's also put in this term A, capital A, I'll explain the Lambert in, in a second, which is basically the weighted average of your lifetime experiences with the thing we're looking at. We're looking at stock market participation, so we look at stock market returns on the right-hand side. How has the S&P 500 in the US been doing over your life so far? And you can do the same with the bond market, bond market experience, bond market return. And what you find is that, um, you know, this is using data of several decades, almost 100 years uh, of the US, um, the, the predecessor of the so-called survey of consumer finance and then the survey of consumer finance. What you find is that if you compare a person who was unlucky enough so that in her life so far, the stock market performed pretty badly, so that's the 10th percentile, like you're in the distribution of people in my data set, you're the lower end. And you compare it to the person who has, was lucky and stock market looked great on average so far, so that's at the 90th percentile. So comparing those two percentiles with the IDR, the interdecile range, then you find that you know, given an average of around 37% of people investing in the stock market over that period I'm looking at, um, that interdecile range is 14 percentage points. So it's a huge effect um, what, what this personal experience that the personal experience has on willingness to invest. And very similar uh, for the bond market. Bond market experiences predict bond holdings with a 15 percentage points effect. The median participation is the same. One last thing I want to emphasize from that research is there is no cross-fertilization. So what do I mean with that? Your experiences in one realm don't go over into another realm. So you know, standard economics has difficulty with that anyhow, right? In a standard economic model, you're born with certain preferences, which you maximize all your life. They don't change. And then you have a certain way of updating beliefs. It might be rational, it might be behavioral, but that's what you do all, all your life. But then if something affects you, for example, if we say, fine, that shock made you more risk averse or something like that, that should apply to all sorts of realms. 
If I become more risk averse, I am more risk averse with all sorts of financial assets. And that turns out, not only in that research, but on the other applications, not to be the same, uh, not to be true. So what happens with, with, if you have a bad stock market experience, it doesn't translate into other financial inv investment, doesn't translate into your spending behavior, doesn't translate into other economic variables. So it's very domain specific, as we call it, which of course makes sense from a neuroscience perspective. It's this word stock and crash that scars depression, maybe. It's not inflation and bond market related stuff. That, would, that isn't the issue, right? So that's an important piece to remember um, as, as part of this experience effect. Now, I was telling you before I would um, maybe comment on what this lambda thing is about. Basically, we also wanted to know, well, but what experiences affect you most? Is it only the peak experiences? Is it um, early impressions matter? Is it the more recent stuff? And in various data sets, so this, this function we used up there is basically a function that allowed us to try out all sorts of different functional forms like declining, increasing. We, we tried more also hump-shaped and so on. What comes out of various data sets is a weighting function that's roughly linearly declining, like this red line, maybe a little steeper sometimes. So what do I mean? Here I have a hypothetical 50-year-old person, and if I'm trying to predict their um, stock market investment, looking at what the stock market did in their life so far, um, I will take all the information going from today back to their birth year, and I will weigh most recent experiences most, um, but even stuff far in the past can get some reasonable weight. And notice, built in here is already, that this red line, if you take that for a second, will look different for a 50-year-old than for a 20-year-old. A 20-year-old, you know, will have this excess weight on stuff happening in their life. So naturally, if it has to sum up, if the weights have to sum up to one, you're right, you're forming in some average, it will be much steeper. Meaning that if uh, like a, a crisis hits and persists for a little bit, the people I'm most concerned about are the relatively young people who will put a lot of weight on it because that's a big part of their life so far. And one last comment about the implications, one I haven't pursued a lot in my own research, but I hope other people will. Um, while in my own research, I am very interested in how individual decision-making can be described, can be better predicted by personal experiences, by personal scarring, trauma, stressors in our life. Um, I do think that also for people who want to kind of predict markets overall can benefit from that. So here's the back of the envelope um, way of illustrating that. If I take now the whole US population based on census data, and calculate for everybody, I mean, I'm taking 25 to 75 here, for everybody in the US, their lifetime average experience was the stock market, just S&P 500. And then I'm averaging that. I can average it liquid, liquid asset weighted or not, doesn't make too much of a difference. I get these red bars. So that's the average experience returns for the whole US population at different points in time, red bars. And then I plot against that with the right scale here, the P.E. ratio, the price earnings ratio. So how highly is the stock market valued compared to how much money they're earning? So a measure of, you know, how bullish the market is right now. And we know from, you know, Campbell Schiller that it often predicts downturn uh, later. Well, you don't need to do any econometrics <laughs> to see that they are correlated. And that's not a mechanic effect, right? Because I am lo losing all the past experiences of all the people alive. And I see that, okay, if there are lots of people who had good experiences around, the level of the stock market goes up. And vice versa, if most people's average lifetime experience was bad, not the recent return was just, so just bad. So I think there's also a lot of potential to predict markets more generally. Um, so there are lots of applications of this experience fake literature. So in addition to stock market depression babies, we've worked on inflation fears, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about more uh, in a second. Um, how we've worked on how unemployment experiences affect consumption spending. My example from the beginning, like if you've lived through tough times and got unemployed, that will stay with you and you will always be a little more careful regardless of how good your employment situation is. Um, this links then to the decision to buy versus rent, have a variable with a fixed rate mortgage, which I'll briefly touch on today as well. But it can also help you understand why maybe, um, example I'm very interested in as a German, living under a different economic system might, uh, a political system might have a long-term impact. So in Germany, we observe that people who grew up in the communist East German, under the communist East German regime, the GDR, 
um, are still affected by the negative messaging about capital markets and stock market in particular. Even the people who, you know, marched on the street and protested against the system, they can't shake this off. And there's a baseline, more less willingness to invest in the stock market. Interestingly, again, depending on their personal life circumstances. If their life under the GDR was pretty good, they were in one of the favorite cities that got renamed, you know, Chemnitz into Karl Marxstadt, and so then you got lots of attention and celebrations and so on. Your life is pretty good. You're definitely against capital markets and stock markets on. If your life is pretty bad, because maybe you come from a culturally very religious area, you come from an area with high pollution, where all the kids had asthma, and you really saw the downside. So not necessarily about stocks, you know, but you are pro, you know, capitalism, you are pro um, uh, capital markets, uh, you invest in stocks at, at significantly higher rates. So, so that really illustrates how these personal experiences kind of feed into how much you incorporated this messaging you had gotten um, um, all day long under the GDR regime. Okay, but let's go to inflation now. Um, so I'm going to just basically walk through the same logic using the inflation example. And um, uh, uh, as I said earlier, I, like the, the, the first papers um, on the topic were joined with Stefan Nagel. We are both German, and we both grew up with these type of pictures in our history textbooks about uh, kids playing with these bundles of Reichmark, which are completely worthless uh, during the Weimar Republic um, hyperinflation. Um, so that topic of why Germans are so obsessed with inflation and distrust anybody other than their Bundesbank to really handle it and, uh, you know, us very concerned about who's running the ECB at various times um, might also be linked back to that, although it needs intergenerational transmission, which is something I'm, I'm working on, but um, we, we, we don't quite have research on that yet. But forget about our German motivation, even in, I mean, the same in other countries. So, for example, U.S. data I often work with, um, has the feature when you work on inflation that, you know, during the 70s you see this steep increase in inflation, the peak in 1980. And it's interesting to see how people like then chairman Paul Volcker comment on the fact that as they're trying to turn around and get to a disinflation uh, scenario, the problem they're struggling with is that, as he says, an entire, gener entire generation of young adults has grown up since the mid 60s knowing only inflation. In fact, inflation keeps accelerating, and that under these circumstances, it's hardly surprising that basically you can't convince people that it's realistic to return to price stability. So it's very different if, if you're in the macro realm from the way we think normally about monetary policy. You know, as if you can only make a credible announcement, use some unconventional monetary policy tools where you announce some fact, and suppose it's totally credible, we like we believe the central bank will do it, problem solved. Well, won't work if, if people are experience-based learners because they just really need to see it. They need to experience this first before their beliefs start, start changing. I think that's what in, in my, is my version of uh, what Volker has been saying there. So to make it more concrete, what we have been doing in, in, in these papers is to argue that when forming beliefs about future inflation, people tend to put a higher weight on realizations, experience over their personal life so far. So it's similar, as I alluded to earlier, it's similar to some of the actually non-behavioral and behavioral research done before. For example, there's the, are these adaptive learning models, Marseille and Sargent, there's Bray paper, where, where people kind of account for the fact something is off here. Maybe people learn following some rule of thumb. But the big difference is that we are pinning down. It's uh, what you have personally experienced during your life so far that has this excess impact. It's not just the last year or the last five years and for everybody the same and for their big changes, they matter. No, we can say how the 25-year-old person will be differently affected from the 75-year-old person. Um, in this data too, like in the depression baby stock market data, we find roughly linearly declining weights, which was kind of really interesting like, to see this pattern over and over again. And it doesn't only affect actually what you say than what your beliefs are, but that it affects actual economic and financial decision-making of borrowing and lending. And I'll show you some graphs of that. So I hope I can explain. I don't, I'm not going to present that paper, but I just want to show this one uh, graph that illustrates the paper. If you ask people in the US, what is your forecast of future inflation over the next year? Um, that has been done in the Michigan Survey of Consumers for many years and decades. 
um, then um, I'm showing you here the raw data. However, I'm, I'm showing you the raw data slightly arranged. First of all, I'm grouping people in below 40. That's going to be my young. 40 to 60 is going to be my middle age, and then above a 60, just to kind of, you know, obviously in the regression you use every age separately, but just to kind of illustrate. And then I'm doing one more thing in this graph. I'm taking out the population average in that year. I'm basically showing you the deviation from what everybody says on average. Because otherwise, clearly, between 1970 and 1980, I mean, everybody was saying, oh, inflation will be high. I mean, it was going up. But I'm just showing the deviations from that. Does it make sense? And so what you see then is a couple of things that um, during the great, inf uh, I mean, the great inflation in the US in the 70s, 80s, um, it was in particular the young people, the blue 40, who like became particularly pessimistic, meaning high inflation. And at times, the difference to the 60-year-old is, um, what is it, like three percentage points, if you take the peak black and the, the bottom blue, blue there. So there are quite some deviations at times, which sometimes we, in macroeconomics, we sometimes just have this representative median uh, average consumer uh, or, or, or investor. There's something we lose out on. So that's one thing you see. You also see that at certain times, the young are more pessimistic. At other times, however, the old are more pessimistic. So it's not like an age-based feature necessarily. And then what you can do with experience effects is basically predict it. So it's not perfect, but it's um, pretty good. <laughs> so same, same dots and, and, and uh, diamonds, etc. But then I'm, I'm putting in the predicted value of what people's experience-based inflation beliefs are in these lines. And you, what you see is that we are able to predict kind of these two spikes of deviations between the young and old in the mid-70s and 1980. Um, I wish my 1980 spike had been a little higher, but you know, it's, a, it's, it's progress from nothing before. And you also see that we're able to capture these reversals. When are the old more pessimistic? When are the young more pessimistic? And that's exactly the power of experience effect, and I think very relevant to policy making to always think, well, if there's recent spike in inflation, if something is happening with mortgage rates, like who will be most affected? Will it be the older people who maybe have their mortgage already and just kind of paying it down? Or will there be a missing generation of homeowners who's unwilling to go for a mortgage? Or vice versa, a generation of people who are too bullish about real estate prices continuing to rise forever and are totally over leveraging and taking out additional loans, um, et cetera. Yeah, so thanks for, for asking, just to point out, so positive means I have higher inflation expectation. So on the left-hand side is expected inflation. Of course, I'm always taking out the average. So if everybody is, ex the average people expect in a year is 10, let's say, during high inflation, then plus one means I expected 11, and minus one means I expected nine. So I'm just showing the deviations from the population mean. And so when it's going up, it means I'm expecting higher inflation. And you're right, I've been calling that pessimistic <laughs> because, you know, very high inflation is, yeah, like, it's, I'm so sorry for using this confusing. I always have that problem with inflation, right? Optimistic means low inflation and pessimistic. It can also be a very satisfactory Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. In, in, in the context of the, of the, high, the great inflation of uh, the 70s and 1980, I think it's pretty clear which direction we are looking. If I were talking about Japan, I should be using the words. So, so I hope I didn't confuse people too much. Up just means I have higher inflation expectations. Don't, down means I have lower inflation expectations. And maybe I should refrain from using optimistic, pessimistic uh, point well taken. And feel free to interrupt me with more um, questions about understanding. Um, here are two sets of graphs from different papers about real estate. So where I kind of want to show that these things really matter for actual behavior, even for cross-country cross differences, in this case within Europe. Um, so in the first paper, which is about tenure choices, so the choice to either buy or rent a home, we were Starting, so, so my actually former uh, 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 student, Alex Valcio, um, and, and I were, were starting to look at these differences across different European countries in terms of homeowner rates. So with which I mean, do you live in a home which you own or do you live in a home that you rent? And if you look, for example, at Spain and neighboring France, you have Spain at 90% and France at 40%. 
somewhere around 60%. Like, how come? Is it really all the regulatory institutional differences? Of course, they're important. So we've been talking during my visit here in, in Sweden so far, we've been talking about the difficulties in the rental market and people might want to rent, but will never get an object to rent. So you can, you obviously need to account for these things. And you know, you always worry that you don't do a good enough job. But what we try, do in this paper is to say, well, using the um, ECB's individual level data from 27 different countries on whether people live in the home they own or not, does this personal experience of inflation matter as well? And the answer is a resounding yes. And I'm just showing two graphs here to illustrate it. So on the left, I have the countries in which home ownership rates are really high, like Spain, like Poland, etc. And I'm plotting um, how the annual inflation rates were over the last couple of decades. And then on the right, I'm showing the countries where home ownership rates is below the median in that country, and I'm plotting inflation over the same last couple of decades. And basically, that's my way, when one slide, of conveying this individual level estimation result. It's infl exposure to inflation has been pretty high, then people feel like, oh, I need to protect my money. Putting it in real estate is a safe bet, and um, uh, as soon as I can, I want to do that. What is really cool is, I mean, this is the European data, which is maybe the focus of the paper, but we also use this US data, the ACS, the American Community Sur uh, uh, Sur Survey, and looked at people who immigrated into the US. So here, the institutional features are the same, one US housing market. But I have people coming from Iran, and from Germany, and from Sweden, and um, uh, South Africa, etc. And then we calculate what, what inflation they were exposed to in their home country until they entered the US. Clearly, this is a different country with different you know, monetary policy, with different fiscal policy, with different money uh, stability of price, price stability, and yet they seem to take that personal experience with them. And again, from a biological neuroscience perspective, that makes a lot of sense, right? Their brains and rewire to say, oof, need to, as soon as I earn some money, I either need to put it in real estate to protect it or it's, it's not rewired. But this is just to say that in Europe, you know, you worry about alternative explanations, but you can even show it in one country, uh, the US um, in, in this case. Here's another real world decision that is affected um, by um, inflation experiences. So, um, in many countries, you have a choice between variable rate and fixed rate mortgages, and so there are puzzling patterns. Um, in particular, in the US, the pattern is that around 80% take fixed rate mortgages, and um, they're sometimes impossible to get for young and lower earners, or they're really uh, relatively expensive compared to variable rates. And we've been trying to understand why is it so persistent in the US that people go for these fixed rates. Well, our suspicion was it has something to do with this great inflation a lot of them experienced in the 70s and 80s. So um, before I go to, to what we do in the paper, here's just some um, possible visual aid. I'm not sure how helpful it is. But from 55 countries worldwide, I was able to get data both on what inflation has been over the last couple of decades and whether they have variable rate mortgages, fixed rate mortgages, or both, and which one is predominant. I'm realizing maybe I can recolor Sweden, and that would actually help me further. But in any case, what this is trying to show here is like the dark colors on the left is that inflation has been really relatively low. And dark color on the right is people are okay with variable rates. So they're primarily variable rates, or, um, or at least both are used. And what that's supposed to indicate is like the dark colors seem to be kind of correlated, meaning in countries where inflation has been a huge problem, people are, really don't like variable rate mortgages. Like the idea that, that the bank can reset the rate and you know, if, if inflation goes up and interest rates go up, then, then that rate will go up, people really hate that. And you can tell them as often as you want that in expected terms is still much, much cheaper because the provider doesn't have to insure their product for 30 years against uh, in, in interest or uh, interest rate risk, doesn't help, they don't take it. So that's what kind of the picture is trying to illustrate. Of course, the actual paper is just using US data and again, using your personal experience with inflation to predict whether you choose a variable or a fixed rate and we get high predictive power. In fact, according to our, it's a little bit of a structural paper, uh, according to our estimation, um, the number of people who chose the fixed rate just because of experience effects 
of course, there are other reasons, right? So the, the paper puts a lot of work into selection effects and so on. But you know, if you believe what we did there, then the people who uh, chose um, fixed rate just because of inflation, largely baby boomers um, who um, you know experienced the 70s, um, 80s inflation, overpaid for their mortgage by about 22 billion compared to the scenario of them choosing a variable rate, which they could have gotten according to our estimates. We put a lot of work in estimating the rate institutions would have offered you if you have, have chosen uh, the variable rate. So this is just to say this, these experience effects have impact on some of the most important, financially most important decisions we, we do over our, our, our lives. Now, one last example on these inflation experiences, which is, um, you know, it started out saying, well, waiting for the, 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 the slides, that sometimes, at least in behavioral finance, behavioral economics, we tend to think about biases as something people who are less informed or less smart, haven't gone to the S Swedish House of Finance or Swedish Stockholm School of Economics and not learned all the good stuff. They do, but smart, well-informed people won't do. And I'm really trying to argue we have to rethink about economic decision making, that our bodies and minds are just changed by how our life has looked like, even if we have all the uh, inf information at our fingertips. So my favorite example to illustrate that is the example of, um, well, it's, it's a paper about central bankers. But the example I love talking about is a guy who was born as Heinrich Wallich in Berlin in 1914 in a, in a family of bankers. Grew up there, lived through Germany's hyperinflation as a youth, young adult, and then the family emigrated, well, first to South America and then to the US, where um, Henry Wallach, by then, <laughs> um, had a really successful career, first at the New York Fed, got a Harvard PhD, and, and was a Fed governor for a long time. So this is a guy which, according to my understanding of sitting on the Federal Reserve Board, has all the data about inflation at their fingertips. There's no informational constraint. Also very smart. I mean, he was very successful. And yet, he holds to this day the record in terms of dissenting when the Fed chairman was saying, oh, maybe we can lower rate. We need to be a little bit concerned about its employment and like, let's not keep the rate as high. He would have these speeches on how people don't understand Inflation could be around the corner. They don't understand the negative implications. And he would you know, vote his dissent um, in terms of keeping interest rate highest. And clearly, this guy knew this is not Germany. This is the US. This is not the 1920s. We are a couple of decades later. It's a different monetary policy. It's a different regime. And yet, he couldn't shake having lived through those experiences is, is what I'm saying. And maybe he might say in 2021, 2022, see? I told you. But um, now, just to say that it's not just him, um, here's a plot where I show the um, Federal Reserve, um, the FOMC members, sorry, um, forecast of what inflation will be um, over different horizons, but let's just take the, the next year, which they provide to Congress in the US in the semi-annual monetary policy report. And I'm, I'm normalizing it by the staff forecast, the, um, the, the uh, information the staff has provided, and I'm plotting it against what the experience effect, the experience-based inflation forecast is, normalized the same way. And basically, what, what hopefully this cloud here illustrates is there's a clear positive relationship. So it's not just Henry Wallach. If I experienced the 70s a spike in inflation um, not too long ago, I'm strongly affected, I'm more well, I shouldn't use pessimistic. I'm expecting higher inflation um, for longer than somebody who didn't or did experience it only very early in life. So in other words, um, you know, my, my colleagues, Christy and David Roma at Berkeley, they have this neat paper where they say these forecasts by Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC members, tend to be worse than what their staff told them before. Like the staff forecast tends to do better than the actual governors and, 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 and regional president. And I'm saying, and I know why, <laughs> because, you know, the staff is an aggregation of all sorts of past experiences put together, but these members just put too much weight on their own personal uh, experiences. Um, and that then translates not only in what they say to Congress, also how to vote. So here I'm uh, showing in blue dovish dissent, meaning people argue in favor of um, lowering rate is more than the chairperson proposed, and on the right, hawkish dissent, uh, lowering it less or increasing it. And um, the, the, the left bars, I just showed the average probabilities of dissent, 2.5 and 
uh, across all the available FOMC meeting nodes. And if I now compare the average person to a person who has had one um, standard deviation increase in personal experience-based inflation, then you see the probability of dovish descent goes about down by a quarter and the hawkish descent goes about up by a quarter. So it doesn't necessarily affect the outcome. Maybe the chairperson st typically still rules the day in terms of what's decided, but these descents are generally viewed as important kind of going forward where the FOMC will be going. Um, so to sum up some features uh, so far, and then if I, I still have a little time, right? About 10 minutes, okay, perfect. Then I'll talk about one more implication. Um, what, I, what I hope might stay with you from the, the papers um, shown so far is that um, we have evidence from many different data sets and different applications in economics and finance that your personal exposure to economic outcomes in your life has long-lasting effects on how you look at the world, what beliefs you form, what expectations you form, and what decisions you make. Um, one implication that sometimes gets maybe too little weight, I find, in policy decision-making is that different courts are affected differently. The young might be pessimistic, the, the, the old might be optimistic, and vice versa, and it's not an age effect. It's not a year effect, in this year we're all pessimistic, optimistic. No, it's different for different courts depending on what has happened in their life so far. Second implication I mentioned is that experience effects are domain-specific, so there's no cross-fertilization. It's really the realm where you associate the shock with, where your decision-making, your beliefs will be um, affected. Um, it's, it's very similar how experience effects work across bonds, stock, inflation, interest rate expectation, unemployment experience, etc. but it's specific to that realm. And that's something traditional economics has a hard time handling. Um, psychologists and psychiatrists have talked, and neuroscientists, about these, I mean, these various words, it's a little bit confusing, but about these domain specificity for, forever. <laughs> And of course, it's harder to handle in, in a model, so we've ignored it, and I think it might be time to do the messy stuff of accounting for it. The third thing I told you is it's very robust um, to learn knowledge. Even experts are affected by their personal experiences. For example, this is my FOMC example. I'm working in a, with a large data set of UCSF um, physicians right now, and it's really cool to see there as well on how if they have experienced bad outcomes with certain decisions they make of I don't know, you have heart problems, you do a stent or just take a, a drug, that, a, a blood thinner, and they, there's an unexpected bad outcome. And they know it's unexpected. <laughs> They're still you know, pushed away from using that, that type of, of treatment. So I think there are uh, probably many other aspects of personal decision making affected by um, personal experiences, even if you're the expert in the field. Um, now, the last thing I want to emphasize, is, which comes out of what I said so far, but I, I do want to share one more example on this, is, well, the extent of the exposure matters, right? I mean, for starters, if you think about the recent inflation spike, so actually starting in terms of core inflation already 2021 and then 2022, we got all really worried about maybe double-digit inflation numbers. Um, now, for me, the question of whether that will have a long-term impact depended a lot on do we, do we manage to tame it, right? Do we, do we get around to reconvincing people we are going back down? How long will the exposure and how will, severe will the exposure to high inflation be? Now, for a lot of these shocks, um, you might experience a different degree of the adverse outcomes depending on your location, maybe depending on your race or ethnicity. I mean, going back to the COVID-19 example in the US, different ethnic and racial groups were affected very differently. Um, by gender, it might be different. And so the long-term effects, therefore, will be really different. So again, when we think about how to handle a crisis, a shock, we need to take that into account that different long-term effects will be observed for different groups and can possibly exacerbate inequality, as in my COVID-19 um, uh, example. Um, so the one example I wanted to add here to illustrate that is in the gender reality. Um, there is actually a long tradition of papers um, arguing that women typically tend to have higher inflation expectation than men. I might, to my best of my knowledge, um, Swedish researcher Lars Jonung in his 1981 paper was actually the first to show it in, in Swedish data from the 70s and early, earlier. But it has been, I mean, you can replicate it for pretty much any time horizon. So with um, Francesco da Conto and Michael Weber, we looked at it actually 
at the time of where we had very low inflation, some 2021, so these are surveys we ran um, just before the pandemic, actually, asking people about their inflation expectations. And we were the first ones to actually do it within household. So you have um, households with a female and a male head of household. We, we chose that subset and um, sort of kind of control as much as possible for wealth and circumstance, et cetera. I mean, still control for the different background. And we replicated that females had higher inflation expectation um, than males. So, so far, so good. Um, and then we asked, well, what could explain that? So, you know, a hypothesis proposed in the past is, oh, the women have less financial literacy, they're less involved with financial transactions, these types of hypotheses. But people didn't get very far with that. And so what we said is, um, so the left-hand side is, is, is uh, the same statistic again, just after taking controls out and so on. Um, so just the gender difference between male and female that remains. But what we then asked is, can we find a proxy for personal experiences in their daily life of inflation? And the one kind of proxy we came up with is we were able to run a survey where we asked people, do you actually do the grocery shopping for your household? <laughs> Um, so, why grocery shopping? I mean, we were interested in it for different reasons, but we know um, food tends to be excessively volatile. Um, that's why it's taken out of core measures of inflation because it's so confusing and you can't detect the trend of inflation anymore if you look at groceries. But as prior research, not our own, prior research has shown already, if you expose somebody to a lot of highly volatile inflation, people tend to latch on to the increasing part and don't put a lot of weight on the uh, downturn path. So that's, that's not my own research, and I'm just using that fact here. So that means if a type of price you see in your daily life a lot is grocery prices, you really think a lot about increasing prices. You experience a lot increasing prices. And so if you're the grocery shopper, that's much more likely to determine what prices you think about and experience, what you pay money for, than if you are not a grocery shopper. So, we looked at the answers to the question, do you do any grocery shopping for your household? Traditional gender roles say it tends to be more the female, and that's still true in the US. Um, and men who indicated that they are not the grocery shopper, um, they're not doing any grocery shopping for the household, had indeed the highest difference in inflation expectations. So the big bar means the difference between female and male was large and significant. If I look at households where men are also grocery shoppers, the difference completely disappears. There's no gender difference anymore. So in other words, when you run a regression trying to predict inflation expectation, you put in your gender dummy, and typically you get a positive coefficient. Women overestimate inflation more than men. That becomes totally insignificant if you control for who does the grocery shopping in your household. I'm not sure about the policy implication here. If, if we have more equal grocery shopping, both exaggerate, have in, uh, exaggerated inflation fears. So maybe um, it would need to be a different one, but clearly you see a way in which kind of this inequality in the environment you live in um, matters. So, yeah. Um, thinking about, you know, what that means when a crisis hits, um, is not only relevant for gender, but you might also, so this, using some German data from my, from my policy work, it might also differ by what income decile you are in, what's your socioeconomic status. So this is data from our last year's annual, annual report, where of course inflation was the big topic, and we tried to calculate what's the, basically the experienced inflation depending by income deciles. Now, Various researchers have uh, put some effort into saying, well, if you're poor, you live in these food des deserts, maybe prices are also more expensive, you experience higher inflation. We see that a little bit for Germany, but actually not as much. And also in the US, it's actually not as strong. And now it's in Sweden, so you see the light blue line decreasing a little bit as I'm going from the lowest income decile to the highest income decile. What you see a lot, however, is what I'm calling the inflation burden. So to what extent is um, the money you're spending as a percent of income affected by inflation. So, so this is just simple math. Is I'm really rich and I'm spending like I'm having huge income and spending a low amount to, to, to pay my, my monthly budget for groceries, etc. Well, then even if that doubles or increased by 10%, it's still a pretty small fraction of my net income. 
If I'm lowest income decile, I'm basically not a saver at all, maybe a negative saver. I barely make it to pay everything. Then this increase in inflation will eat up a huge fraction um, of, my, of, of my net monthly income. So the blue lines try to illustrate that a lot, like the felt inflation, how much it's constraining me, how much it's scarring me. There is hugely between low income and high, um, high income population. So I haven't studied that. I'll get to your question, just, just finish the sentence. Um, that, that, that result yet is also too recent, but that would predict that um, if you're worried about scarring effect, if the inflation had stayed high for a long time, or maybe even with the degree of inflation we've had for one, two years now, I'm worried in particular about this distorting views regarding price stability among lower uh, income households compared to higher income households. Question? Top decile has a negative inflation burden. Is that through the ownership of real assets, or how, how, how should you understand that? Um, yeah, but it's, it's it just uh, what percentage of your net income is affected by it. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm rushing through some of these slides, but yeah. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't put in the same picture. It, it, it seems as if you should be able to compare it, and you can't really. But um, thanks for asking. So here, the, the, the dark blue is just the percent of net income that gets eaten up because of inflation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Okay, two moments, yeah, I can do that. Um, so I have one more slide with words and then a couple of pictures, so I should be able to handle it. So let me sum up so far. If I start to think about the welfare and policy implications of experience effects in inflation, I would like to highlight a few things. First, there are long-lasting implications of personal experiences and they depend on how long the duration is and how severe it is. Even if we are back to the status quo under, we have successfully disinflated, there will be lingering effects on beliefs and on, on behavior. That effect has a certain automaticity. <laughs> um, so if I think that as a finance professor I can fix it by teaching well, or politicians think with information campaigns, or monetary policy makers think with credible policy announcements they can fix it, they will be wrong. I'm not saying they're useless, but I'm saying there is an excess effect of personal experiences. So one practical example is this German um, policy response to the spiking prices uh, in, in Germany in terms of gasoline um, when, um, um, you know, after, after, the, uh, after, after the start of the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, um, which was something that seems to make no economic sense. And, and fundamentally, it doesn't make any economic sense. I'll stick to that, but <laughs> there's a spoiler of argument. It was a German Tankrabat. So they basically said, okay, people are really desperate. They're going to the gas station and so expensive to drive. So we're gonna subsidize it. We're gonna give a rabat, we're gonna give a discount on gas prices. So all the economists, including me, are like, what? <laughs> we need the signal of prices to work and people like to drive less, don't make it cheaper, right? And I'll, on net, I still stick to that. But there's one aspect that's actually positive, which is in terms of how much it scarred people, like, ooh, this is a terrible time. Every day when I go, or once or twice a week when I go to the gas station, I see this increase in prices and they go higher and higher, was somehow buffered. And in terms of long-lasting effect, something like this can actually be helpful. Which means also that there is a heightened conflict between monetary and fiscal policy. So like from a monetary policy perspective, when inflation goes up, I want to say, okay, you know, we need to be careful with spending. We need to get inflation down. From fiscal policy perspective, it may make sense to support those parts at least of the population who are most affected by it. Of course, you know, what we have been trying to tell the government to do it in a targeted manner, not do like Trump did, send checks to everybody but they try to do it to the low income uh, population so you, you, you minimize the fiscal stimulus. And then finally there's a spillover of, in terms of the role of media and communication. So if you can communicate in a very experiential <laughs> way, if you can do a little Netflix movie about it, <laughs> that might actually be more helpful than explaining how monetary policy work. And one of my colleagues, Michael Weber, always talks about the reggae songs which the Central Bank of Jamaica does about um, price stability and that they, you know, might be more effective. Um, so this is all I have to say inflation. I just wanted to summarize again where, where I started from with three pictures. Um, you know, I, I was contrasting this like new approach of experience effect with standard economic model. So here's my standard neoclassical homo economicus of maximizing payoffs, forming Bayesian beliefs and doing all of that with perfect cognition. And we knew already something is, not, oops, something is not right there. 
and realize, well, maybe it's not just money, but morals and social preference matter. Maybe I'm not rationally forming beliefs. I'm overconfident and think this pawn is a king or whatnot. And maybe I have limited attention and limits to cognition. But I'm still a little robot who acts according to what's pre-programmed. And what we are trying to bring in is the biology, neuroscience, cognitive science, medicine, which says, no, um, what I live through affects my cells, inflammation. Um, it affects my brain formation and should be taken into account whether I'm thinking about rational or irrational decisions. So maybe instead of homo economicus, just homo or homo experience. And I'll end with that. Thank you. I'm just going to take some water here, sir. Uh, now I open the floor for questions. Um, please, we have already have a couple of clarification questions. Yeah, uh, no. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand so you can get the microphone. And it would be very nice if you say your name and where you are from. Uh, and maybe I could start with one question. Sure. Uh, you, you, you told us that you are studying now the period 1990 to 1994 around what's happening in Sweden. Is there some preliminary research that you all already can <laughs> pa share, share with us? I don't know whether Paolo is comfortable with that, but just stop me. Um, um, well, one thing I didn't emphasize a lot in the talk, although I alluded to it, is that I think we will make progress when we realize how much these effects just go through our whole body. I mean, just basically as a point in... In, 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 to make a, the point that we shouldn't just kind of slightly retweak our beliefs, you know, lots of macrofinance models, oh, I believe this, like some of it's here and there, and we just kind of play around with it. But we have to go back to what's happening with us. And so to, tomorrow in the, in the economics seminar, I will talk about a paper I have on how CEOs who live through crises have to fire people are really stressed by that and age faster and die earlier. <laughs> um, it's a little depressing, but it's a good sample to look at because these people are rich and don't have other financial constraints, and yet it affects them. But of course, the people we really care about is the overall population. How, what did the COVID-19 pandemic do to people coming out? How does it affect their longevity? How does it affect your body? How, how, what kind of illnesses do you get? And so the given that Paolo has this amazing capability to get all sorts of data that exist in Sweden together and, and merge it and so on. Like we started talking about this topic at my last visit actually here. And he was saying, well, maybe we can make progress and had some own interest in, in these type of uh, like medical um, outcomes. And that's what we're trying to explore. So next time, hopefully he or I can tell you uh, what this crisis did to all of those who lived through it. But I have some thoughts because I've also been using some recent data, I mean, US, US data, um, to kind of like follow a little bit what happens to people's lifetime average inflation experience. I mean, that's easy to measure, but also what happens to their beliefs. Maybe first an anecdote. Um, some of you may have followed then, but first inflation first started going up. There were some people like Larry Summers in the US who were immediately, I mean, pretty early on saying, well, this is dangerous, let's do something. But then there were other people, you know, there was team transitory who said, no, it's just a spike and it will go away. And we, um, Stefan Nagel and I actually collected some like Twitter data and group people, like roughly. I, I don't think we can do a paper with that. But, you know, a lot of people who had experienced the 70s and 80s um, were among those who were like relatively quickly able to see that something more was happening. Now, in terms of what's happening to people who basically have seen no inflation all their lives before that, um, we saw, in fact, that, you know, they kind of actually exactly consistent with our model. They were like, you know, saying, no, I have like 20 years of no inflation. This thing, like, you know, doesn't affect me. So there's actually, I mean, if you go into the details of the paper, I'm not only updating the mean, there's also an autocorrelation coefficient I'm updating. So these people think it's like, it's really persistent. That must be transitory. And so the thing we are predicting, and we started to see actually, is these, these young people who said, no, all my life, no inflation, a little spike doesn't do anything. They would then overshoot if it persists. So if it persists, then suddenly, let's say it was five years, then it's five years out of 25 years, so it's huge. So what we are predicting is that, you know, everybody's maybe updating in the higher inflation direction, and the younger need a little longer, but if it persists for too long, they will, they will go above. And so, so far, all I can say is the data is not inconsistent with that, but um, hopefully you are getting a handle on it. So hopefully we don't have to test whether I was right. <laughs> but that's exactly what we've seen 
um, with, with, with other data, for example, the stock market data, they had this really long time series, and the paper is called Depression Babies, but it's not just about the depression. And so that's, that's exactly what you see. Some crash happens. If it's bad enough, big enough, then the young people go down very dramatically and don't want to do any stock anymore. Older generations you know, also don't like it, but uh, they don't lower, lower as much. It's kind of <clears throat> funny that when, when I actually I joined um, this Council of Economic Advisors in Germany and people are like, oh, what policy initiative do you stand for? Like, you know, labor market reform, this and that. And I, my answer was um, uh, having more access to data and merging data sets. That is my <laughs> policy initiative because I exactly with you that having this individual level heterogeneity of effects available and then also vice versa to do targeted policy intervention in particular in times of high inflation, right? Not give it to, to everybody but just kind of see whom I want to target I think is hugely important. Another aspect of what you said and how, like how experience effects matter in practice is what I see in politicians. So for example, you know, our chancellor, Olaf Scholz, has like lived through times where when there was an economic crisis, the main variable to look at is unemployment. And that has really scarred and this has made politicians have to leave their post. Right now, Germany is suffering from huge aging, demographic aging. Given the demographic aging, we, despite the downturn, we don't have much of an unemployment problem at all. We're basically at, 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 at full employment. It's not because of any magic of the labor policymakers. It's just, you know, because we don't have enough workforce there. So maybe that's not the main variable we need to think about. So, so when the politicians say, oh, how do we, you know, rekindle growth? Where is the next growth era coming from? And you're trying to tell them, well, maybe our industry composition has to change because energy is pretty expensive in Germany, so maybe high energy intensive chemistry or automobile, past the parts of automobile and, and, and um, machinery like won't do as much anymore. You see there are immediate negative reaction because that's lots of jobs associated with it. But you need to think differently given that we're living in a different reality right now and it's really, <laughs> it's nearly not getting, it's this immediate reaction thinking about oh, the unemployment numbers and the demonstrations and so on is there, which, which is, which is and I mean the flip, it's not what you asked about, but it's really a flip side of experience effect mattering for policy. And so to put it more positively, thinking about who makes decisions, what is their personal experience is really important. So sometimes that is kind of, dismissed a little bit in this movement towards more diversity, in particular in, in the US. Do we really need one black person and one female person to make a decision there as well? Don't we just need to go for the best, like the best economists or the best and so on? No, it will filter through in how they look at the world. For me, it has helped me a lot to think about why we need more diversity among policy decision makers because they will have some automaticity about thinking about their own ex experience. So I, I've thought about this um, a little bit. I mentioned I have one paper where I'm thinking also about international capital flows and fickleness and, and so on. And um, one variable I've found is, I don't think I have a completely general question, but it's, it depends on the composition of market participants. So, um, you know, before we are saying that roughly speaking, the younger generation will overreact more. I mean, it depends on what variable we're looking at and whether it's autocorrelation or so on. But roughly speaking, the young will overreact. So if you're in a young, growing economy where, say, the stock market is full of young people because the population, the demographic is very good, there's a lot of young people, then it might exacerbate things. So, right, if, if like stock market goes up, everybody's taking too much risk and, and not diversifying enough. If it goes down, everybody completely withdraws from the markets. While in an aging society, I think like I you know, like Germany unfortunately is, but this effect will be buffered because they're basically people who have seen a lot of things and don't have these, these strong reactions. So that's one thing I've thought about. And then sometimes, um, you know, um, how can I put that? You know, um, I think uh, Olivier Quabion recently said that to me, so that in, um, in education we sometimes think about how our kids need to make their own experiences to really learn something, right? So like you can't tell them as often as you want, but maybe you need to let them fail so they fully understand it. So the right little crisis at the right moment when everybody, you know, think about the Swedish stock market. 
things have been going really well. There are generations of young people, I was told at lunch today also, who are like in these chat rooms and feel they can pick stocks and, and so on and so forth. And you know, so far not too, too many bad things have happened to them. Well, occasionally, but not too bad because generally, you know, things are going really great. Nice, nice little crisis, like not too bad, but a little bit, sh you know, some shock coming out of that, I think might actually be a good thing, in which case the crisis would help because you need to experience it to, 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 to buffer these exaggerations.